You know, birds and squirrels look for fermented berry juice and get drunk. I'm sure when we were monkeys in trees, we were doing the same damn thing. I mean, like, oh, that fruit over there, when it ferments, I see pretty pictures. You know, I'm sure we were looking for stuff and, and altering our chemistry because we co-evolved. Dr. Andrew Hill, it's great to be with you. Thanks for having me, Liam. Appreciate it. Yeah, well, so I thought, could you just give us some background on kind of how you got into brain training and what brought you to this point? Sure. So, so I do a lot of uh, these days. I do biohacking across a bunch of things, including uh, neurofeedback or, or brain training is my primary uh, sort of tool set. But I've been working in mental health and human services for a long time since the, the early 80s, actually the late 80s. Um, and uh, throughout that whole time, I worked in group homes and acute care centers for people with psychiatric crises and uh, dual diagnosis sort of inpatient centers for drug and alcohol as well as psychiatric stuff and developmental, you know, residential homes for people with severe developmental issues. And across all these range of health and human services, I saw a lot of people not really getting any better, you know, so a lot of holding patterns especially in, in uh, higher functioning, so to speak, mental health care, uh, where you would think people who've you know, been functional and are now not you know, less so, you'd think we'd have tools to help them get back to the stability or productivity or safety um, that uh, they had had recently. But generally, uh, it was hard to find that sort of thing. And I saw a lot of people who were in crisis in holding patterns where they're being sort of managed but not helped all that much. And I also saw a lot of, you know, more acute sort of longer term developmental processes, you know, autism and other things where we just didn't have many tools to help. And this is my perspective after, you know, 20 years or something in the field. And then I got exposed to neurofeedback and saw symptoms shift and autism and seizures drop away in many kids and ADHD things just get resolved in kids and adults. And I was sort of like, this doesn't totally track with my experience of how we work with the brain this is kind of exciting and what's going on here and you know uh, this was back in again we're talking uh, the 90s now some point and at that point there was still in the the field of neurofeedback is still fairly young and, and nichey um, I mean here we are in 2020 and the field is uh, the way it's practiced now a lot of the field is derived around a particular technology called SMR training and SMR is a frequency in the brain uh, about 12 to 15 cycles per second, 12 to 15 hertz in humans, adult humans. And SMR is a bunch of things that it does in, in mammals. Uh, largely, it helps the brain with things like inhibitory tone. So uh, humans use it to stay asleep. So it's called sleep spindles. If you're deeply asleep and a car goes by your house and honks a horn, you generally don't rouse. You kind of might start to wake up and then your brain suppresses the rousing phenomena because you aren't threatened. And the suppression, the maintenance of your sleep is a function that uses SMR. And SMR is also used in things like keeping the brain away from seizure states, you know, keeping it sort of stable as opposed to chaotic and, and dysregulated. And uh, the field was, I might as well, uh, this is a, a decent story to go into. The field was started again about 53 years ago, 1967. Uh, Dr. Barry Sturman at UCLA was approached by NASA, whose um, astronauts were getting sick breathing in the methyl hydrazine, you know, vapors from the rocket fuel and things. And so Sturman was doing a safety toxicity study essentially on rocket fuel. And he discovered that of all the, he was using cats as his test subject. This is the sixties. Our animal research was a little different back then. Uh, and um, we discovered that, he discovered that some of the cats he was trying to sort of, you know, figure out how toxic this, this, this rocket fuel was. Some of the cats wouldn't, wouldn't have the same symptoms as other cats. Most of them had, dizziness and, and, and uh, crying and drooling and seizures and you know all kinds of crazy symptoms and exposed uh, exposure to the, to the rocket fuel vapors correlated with increased symptoms as a function of time you know dosing time kind of curve stuff but some of the cats had these super powerful brains that refused to have seizures and needed two and a half times the exposure before they showed these sort of seizure events in the brain and he figured out he'd done a conditioning experiment in the cats six months prior to train up cats SMR to see if it was a trainable thing, if you could actually use operant conditioning. So he measured the cats SMR with a little tiny scalpel electrode 
and put a chicken broth, uh, a little, little milk dropper in their mouth and squirted chicken broth in, into their mouth whenever the SMR surged. And you've seen SMR if you've ever met a cat or owned a cat. Uh, that phenomenon of them lying on a windowsill and watching intently out the window with the body's liquid, totally inhibited, but the mind is very still and like sort of on. That states SMR. And humans use it for the cognitive thing sometimes. We don't use it the way predators do. They have to relax deeply before jumping into action. So it's deeply inhibited physically while mentally focused. And that state of being still in your body and not so still but kind of pointed in your mind, um, that's the opposite of ADHD in humans. So if you train up, if you exercise the SMR in humans, you produce this big shift in function and you reduce inhibitory problems. So we often get effective uh, elimination of ADHD in a few months, you get reductions in seizures. The literature is about 50% um, in, the, in the, the metadata studies that, that came out show that the average person gets about a 50% reduction. And some people it's complete control of seizures. Um, I've never seen somebody only get 50% reduction. It's always a pretty strong effect. But then you can go after almost like cosmetic fitness for your brain. You can sort of say, ooh, I'd like abs in my brain. I want to be a better listener or more creative or have flow state access or you know, dial away that old trauma I have or whatever it is. So I got this, this awakening, so to speak, working in these centers with acute people, autism and severe ADHD and seizures and things, you know, developmental stuff mostly, and was seeing change on, in, in a realm of symptoms that I didn't think were changeable based on how we dealt with the brain. And so this was uh, in around 2000 or so, and I had this sort of you know, epiphany of what, what's going on here? There's all this technology being used into the really weird niche area of the field. Some are scientists, some are psychologists, some are crazy engineers, and there's this thing called biofeedback on the brain, neurofeedback, ooh, cool. And so I didn't know about it, it, was, it wasn't very mainstream, and there's some reasons for that, why it wasn't mainstream in the 70s and 80s, but uh, it got a little, more, a little more mainstream, and as I was getting deeper into the field, I sort of figured out that all of the ideas about what this stuff is were kind of not reconcilable. You know, everyone had, a, oh, it works this way, and they were getting results, but not getting uh, sort of an under, underpinning that you could theoretically test or exploit or use for the next person reliably. And so I call this a blind men and elephant situation. You know, we all have a piece of something, we're describing it, but not really seeing the 10,000 foot view picture. So I uh, went back to school, went to UCLA and got a PhD in cognitive neuroscience, studying uh, EEG, how the brain processes attention, lateralized attention, and how you can push the brain around with neurofeedback. I tried to figure out some of the mechanism that was actually happening at the moment of the brain binding to being dragged around by this training process, uh, which is not actually about squirting chicken broth in your mouth if you're a human. Um, humans like stimuli, so all you have to do is watch something on a screen and listen to things, and uh, you can stick a wire, like the SMR. Humans make SMR on the center motor strip, which runs ear to ear, and if you're sitting very still and relaxed, your mind's kind of you know, balanced, it's an SMR state. So you can measure a part of the brain on the right, which is involved with supervisory attention, knowing if you're paying attention or not. And measure how much SMR it's making, and also measure its theta brain waves. Theta is a receptive state, creative, noticing things, stuff bubbling up, patterns jumping out, but it's not a very linear state. So high theta and low SMR is kind of ADHD, effectively. It's not exactly quite that simple, but it's sort of that phenomena. It's disinhibited. So if you measure the theta and SMR under the right-hand side of that supervisor, and you applaud the brain, make the car drive faster, or the spaceship steer better or the Pac-Man eat more dots, whenever the brain happens to drop its theta and raise its SMR, those little bursts of applause and increased stimuli tell the brain, ooh, good job, ooh, good job. Oh yeah, yeah, good job there. And the brain picks up the trend and goes, I'm getting awarded, I'm getting cool stimuli when stuff, hap you know, stuff happens when I drop my theta, nice, and my, and my SMR's going up, more stuff's happening. You can't control it because you can't control your brain waves. You sit there and watch a game stopping and starting. But the next day, your brain's like, I was getting stuff whenever theta dropped, and suddenly your theta will share, and you, oh, I feel really nice and focused and briefly. Then it goes away. It's like working out, you know, a week or two into your first gym adventure, you're, you're going for a walk and coffee, you're like, ooh, my balance. I feel a little different. And it's not that dramatic, but it comes and goes, and, you know, maybe your sleep's better one night after your workout or something. So that's what happens when you work on your brain, but it kind of is, no pun intended, top down. So you really do sort of get everything shifted in your life, all your your capacities get, get worked out. And as you work on different circuits and, and different uh, physiology, you get different effects. So you can kind of be a little bit like 
it's kind of like walking to Equinox and going, I want abs. And they go, all right, it's a different process a little bit for each person, but it's kind of the same process broadly. And we'll tweak it for you and identify the weak spots. And for you, maybe it's better sleep as the big blocker. For this other guy, it's the, you know, the 19 pizzas a day he eats. Um, you know, for somebody else, it's never having actually lifted you know, anything with their, with their whole body. Um, so, you know, you can dial in the sort of personal training aspect and you can do it for the brain resources you can identify like executive function, stress response, sleep, speed of processing, stuff like that. So long-winded answer, but when I discovered we had some agency over all this stuff and I saw it making change in a place that I didn't think we were all that good at making change in human brains, I got very excited and had to sort of double down on the, you know, beating this drum that you should be doing neurofeedback and taking control of your brain kind of, kind of stuff. So. Wonderful. Well, and so when you mentioned neurofeedback, I think probably a lot of the listeners haven't been to a brain gym before. I think of this device, it's a consumer electroencephalograph that measure that this is the only neurofeedback I've done where it was giving me direct feedback on my meditation progress. So walk us through what this actually looks like and yeah. what kind of equipment is involved. Sure. So I do two things. Um, one is called brain mapping or quantitative EEG, QEEG. And this is an assessment tool that looks at one person's brain in relation to kind of population averages. It doesn't use it diagnostically. We, aren't, we don't care that you aren't average. In fact, people are generally not average. What we care about is if the ways that you're very unusual, if those things jump out as stuff that is off in a bottleneck, we'll test that idea. Oh, hey, this shows up when you're like, if you have a high theta beta ratio in kids, that's 94% accurate roughly for spotting ADHD, as long as there's not a lot of sleep deprivation making the data look strange. You know, the, the one single measurement top of the head, measuring theta to beta, it's high, that ratio is high, executive function problems exist. So to gather the sort of assessment data, you just do a resting EEG, put a cap on your head, squirt it full of gel, sit still for maybe 15, 20 minutes. And in that time frame, you're gonna do an eyes closed recording and an eyes open recording, because the brain has two very different baseline states when you're awake, eyes closed and eyes open is a dramatically different uh, mode in some ways. Um, at least in the EEG it is because it's such an expensive thing to run vision. So big gross shifts in what your brain's doing at rest can give me some idea about how it's operating. So in the case of vision, if I looked at your eyes closed recording and saw the back of the head, which is your visual system, wasn't going idle, wasn't making alpha waves when your eyes were closed, I would go, oh, hey, for some people, when they're staying lit up in a beta frequency and the alpha isn't coming up, that means they're not letting go of the visual system with their eyes closed. That often means kind of a hypervigilance state where you're scanning or preparing to scan. Your brain's like staying lit up just in case. Do you have some like hypervigilance? Do you have to scan everything? Or, oh, you do. Okay, well, this is probably related. Oh, you don't? Okay, maybe your neck is tight. Maybe you're just active. Maybe you're a firefighter or a first responder. Maybe it's a skill, not a problem. You know, but I find the unusual thing going, hey, is this mat does this matter? Is this relevant? Like, like a coach does with an athlete, not like a doctor does with a patient, you know, because it's not about here's what's right or wrong. It's about here's a feature that's statistically unusual. Do you care about this? Does it matter? So um, the opposite uh, pattern might show up as well. You open your eyes, you look at the back of the head. If you don't see beta waves, if you stay stuck in the alpha, you know, stuck in the neutral frequencies, that is generally inattention. We call that ADD. So, you know, I make some predictions about states. We also measure your performance. I do executive function testing. So measure sustained focus, short-term focus, auditory and visual attention, uh, inhibition versus uh, activation. Uh, tease apart a bunch of things in an extremely boring 25 minute test. I apologize in advance to anyone who takes, who does the attention testing. It's just a computerized test, but it is so tedious. We kind of unload your attention and make you respond in the time course where you can't use automatic resources. So it's only like 20 minutes long, but it's a long 20 minutes or something, you know? Um, so the attention test is, is, a, is a population level average, and so is the brain map. And from there, we develop a picture together. Oh, this is, might be going on, here's some goals, what do you wanna work on? Just like you would go over your fitness data with your high-end trainer. And from there, we do the neurofeedback, which we do three times a week uh, for half an hour. And we don't bother to put the full head cap on. We go discreetly after specific locations and circuits and try to exercise and then we observe the next day. So we use little devices like this. This is a little mini EEG amplifier. So I have these in people's homes as well as in uh, um, my offices. 
and you just put some ear clips on and plug them into the box and you put one wire on the part of the head, maybe two, that you want to exercise. You want to measure the brain waves from. And again, eight executive function work, maybe there's a wire on this side for ADHD, for being more alert and on, maybe it's the vigilant side. If you have some uh, OCD, then on your, your brain map, what I'll see is the front midline of your brain is stuck in beta, that's the anterior cingulate. And that's a switching system. I might go, oh, hey, some people that have a lot of beta there, their switching system gets a bit wound up and they tend to perseverate, get stuck on things. You bite your nails, get songs in your head, little OCD, Maybe you're CEO, maybe it works for you fine, but you will stuck sometimes? Oh, you are, okay. And then you can you know, measure, I'll put a wire here, whenever it kind of unclenches that resource briefly on its own, because the brain's always changing. So we're not doing anything active with the brain. We're not pushing you around, we're not zapping your brain. We're sort of measuring the variability, like the, the beta waves, the alpha waves, things changing in amplitude and speed. And when your brain happens to move on its own for half a second in the right direction, the game you're watching runs better. The Pac-Man needs more dots. The spaceship flies faster, you know. So what are, topic. sorry, so for those unfamiliar, what are those brain waves you mentioned a couple times, the gamma, the beta, yeah. alpha? So brain waves uh, are bursting little rhythms within the, within the brain. The brain has a cortex or the bark, the top surface of the brain, which is mostly what we think about. We think about the brain, the gray matter is just the top layer. It's all these little sulci and gyri, these little grooves and, and hills and valleys and things. And that's mostly for surface area. It's a pretty huge amount of surface area squished in like a little, like a rag wadded up. It's squished in for massive surface area. But that's, the, that's largely the computational tissue you use for input output on your senses and to think in. So you're doing kind of your experience as a human, that bark, that top cortex. And the circuits, there's a couple billion little circuits in that, in that cortex uh, that are comprised of 30,000 roughly neurons in a little column that are kind of like a little CPU. And they pump out different firing rates as a unit. 30,000 neurons, for probably 100,000 support cells, all computationally chunking out the same information, firing or not firing. And then they all talk to other little CPUs and make really complicated networks that can come offline and online moment to moment. So you're looking at the sort of activity of this little neighborhood of friends hanging out, talking in different circuits and making calls between each other and doing little dances together. And that's the EEG. Now, the speed or the amount of firing coming off of each of these cells or groups of cells called microcolumns is what you're measuring on the scalp from the outside. You're measuring bursts of electricity or bursts of signaling from these little columns. Now, alpha waves are what we often hear about in sort of pop, in popular terms. Alpha is a calm state. Uh, alpha is a relaxed state. I mentioned earlier, you close your eyes and the visual cortex goes into alpha and rests in alpha. But we make all brain waves all the time. So it's not like you're making alpha when you're resting and making delta when you're sleeping. I mean, you are, but you're making all those waves, you know, in different circuits all the time. So if you go in order of speed, you actually would start down at zero bursts or close to zero is delta waves. And delta waves happen between about zero and up to about four, uh, maybe three and a half times per second or hertz or cycles. So delta is like, you know, three to four hertz, maybe two, three couple times per second, big delta waves. And then you have theta, which is four to seven little waves per second. And then alpha is like seven to 13. And then beta is like 13 to 40. And above 40 you're in gamma. And you can't really measure gamma from outside the head. So a lot of consumer devices that use the word gamma, they're kind of misleading you. Um, you kind of need to be inside the skull to measure gamma. It's a little tiny wave. And gamma is like 40 hertz and above. So the same amount of energy, like 10 microvolts in a delta wave is one big giant delta wave that's 10 microvolts of juice. The same gamma will be little tiny little waves, you know, 40 hertz of them. And that little burst, when, when, when the, the electricity is produced in the brain, the, the soft tissue, and it goes through layers of scalp, skull, meninges, or wrapping layers. And every time the waves pass through those layers, they get dampened, they get attenuated. So when you measure stuff from outside the head, you can't measure anything above about 40 hertz because it's just being attenuated out. It's gone. So don't believe the word gamma. Gamma in EEG is, is, is kind of a misleading term, kind of like the word quantum is in health circles. Like if you hear the word, if you hear the word quantum, run away in a health context. It just doesn't mean what people, you know, it's all marketing and nonsense and it's looking for gullibility, you know, trying to sound good. Um, the word detox isn't far behind in health circles. You don't accelerate your body's detox ability. You just can't. And there's very little you can do um, to you know, 
accelerate sort of processes of detoxification. You can't alkalize your, your body either. There's no, you know, the only thing you can do for alkalizing, alkalizing your body is dye. So, you know, the, your body is so good at holding the alkalinity, the pH at a, a rigid level. If you go off by 0 0.2, 0 0.3 pH, you die. Boom, dead, sorry, there you go. So the only thing you're, you're, you're making alkaline by drinking that water is your toilet water. It's passing right through you and making your toilet alkaline. You're supplementing your toilet by drinking alkaline water, you know? And, and anything, you know, I have, I have some access to grind, obviously, but anything that, 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 that world of, wait a minute, what's, what are you talking about? Can you please define that term? And if they can't, like, you know, I don't want to hear about your quantum health tech, I'm sorry. Anyway, stepping down off the rant, um, the waves are we, we, we think of alpha because that's the first Greek letter of the alphabet might be the first brainwave. That was the first one we discovered because it was so obvious. You close your eyes and big giant alpha waves show up everywhere. And alpha, Hans Berger discovered EEG in I think the 1930s or before, before that actually, I forget the actual date. But he found it uh, in the rabbit cortex, little giant bursting slow bunny rabbit ray, uh, waves, alpha waves. So alpha was the first wave discovered and then beta above it, was another variant, a little faster wave. And then only later on, we discovered there was things slower than it. So alpha, beta, delta, and then gamma. So it's out of order, unfortunately, in terms of the Greek alphabet. Um, for all you Greek aficionados out there who are burning, wondering why delta waves are the slowest, and gamma waves are fast, but it kind of jumps around between, that's why. It's just the order of discovery. I, I know somebody was, is, is now happy they know that. Um, some some, some EEG, got, EEG geek out there is like, oh, I get it now. So. You're welcome. But uh, we don't know what all these things do. And there's many brain waves with any frequency for different functional things. Like I mentioned, the alpha waves show up when your visual system is idle, but you also make another form of alpha on the motor cortex called mu, which is involved with mirror neurons activating and echoing what you're seeing. So if I see you eat an ice cream cone, my mirror neurons from my hand moving and licking an ice cream cone might go off because I'm empathizing with, oh, that looks really good. And my, my, my brain will echo it. If I'm not autistic, it'll make little mu waves, motor imagery. If I imagine that, that, that oh, it must be really good to, to grab that ice cream cone. If I imagine the motor imagery, it'll echo it, echo what I'm seeing in my own, my own control systems. So you can look at lots of different brain waves, but we don't really understand them. And we end up doing kind of a phenomenological thing where it's like, oh, here's what's average, here's what's an outlier. And there's some understanding of the different brain waves, but until we get specific, I mean, we know about seizures, we know about you know, other types of problems, but the general 10,000 foot view of the brain is still fairly mysterious. So we're not really doing medicines. I mean, if we are, it's kind of like functional medicine, the way your functional medicine doc looks at ranges and patterns and tries to find the, the thing that'll make a difference. But your functional medicine doc isn't looking for the absolute one discrete bit of medical information. They're trying to find that sense of where the bottlenecks are in your metabolism or you know, what's suboptimal and that will affect your experience. So they're trying to look at the root of the system, not sort of the, the, you know, the, the, the plus or minus of a disease, essentially. So neuroscientists work the same way when it comes to the brain because we don't really understand it, but we can measure it and make some guesses. And then when it comes to neurofeedback, we can apply levers to make change and see what happens. And you have the opportunity to go, well, it's like fitness. Did that work? How do you feel today? Oh, you can't move your arms? Let's take some weight off the machine next time. Oh, you felt great? Oh, it's too easy? Let's crank it up. How'd that feel? And you can be very iterative in neurofeedback and you can get subtle changes because that half an hour of the brain being applauded for certain brain waves doesn't produce a huge change. You get about a day of subtle surge and then dropping of the brain's activity from one or two sessions. And so as you evaluate what different workouts do, you learn your own brain better and better and then you can dial access to the states and reliable, um, uh, robust, if you will, uh, 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 flexibility and stamina in those states just by going after things. Oh yeah, that feels like this. And then you can go back to the brain mapping and the attention testing. Uh, we do it every 20 sessions. If people are near the office, some of my clients have brain mapping gear because actually this is a brain mapping amplifier, a little tiny thing. And people put a cap on their head, plug this into it, a little Bluetooth amp. They spurt their, their cap full of gel. And we do remote brain maps now uh, all over the world. And you can see the change. So you're feeling different. I think I'm feeling better and my, my kids, you know, performing better in school, seizures are dropping, whatever it is. And then you look at your brain map and you've made a couple of standard deviations of change against the population in a few months generally. So it's a huge change subjectively. And then you can go back to the data and evaluate, tension testing, brain mapping, and see if there's been a big shift 
in things that don't shift in, in sort of conventional wisdom. Uh, and then it becomes a process of like, well, what's next? You know, you want to, people come in often like, oh, I got ADHD. Okay, great. Let's, you know, and, or some trauma, not to minimize it, but like, I'm kind of happy when people come in with some trauma because it's like, this is a lovely thing to work on. You know, it's like a chiropractor. Oh, another back injury. Oh, I'm sorry to see that, but they know they can help. Uh, you know, when people come in with ADHD, migraines, seizures, trauma, OCD, uh, all kinds of things, sleep issues, I get sort of like, great, let's find this thing in their brain and give them some control over it. And then the relationship in, as we go over the uh, brain mapping isn't a, I'm sorry, sir, here's what's wrong with you. It's a, oh, hey, here, here's a thing. Do you want to work on this? Is this important? Oh, it is? Cool. I'm sorry, you're experiencing this, you know, brain fog or impulsivity or seizure thing, but like, cool, there's something showing up here. Let's go after that. You know, see how you feel. And then people end up becoming the, 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 agent, the agent of their change, you know, which is often not how we, we experience our brain health and our psychology. You know, we often kind of give ourselves over to other people to help us figure out what we're feeling or thinking or give us medication to change our states. And this is instead like, okay, let's dial in, let's help you understand the levers that you might want to pull to change your own states. And so, you know, I'm not sure what the metaphor is, but you know, those gym guys that like get all swole and can't put their arms down because it's so easy to build upper body mass for men, right? And they're like, oh, this is great. I do have people who get incredibly, you know, creative and focused and calm uh, because they need neurofeedback well beyond, you know, fixing any problems. I sort of joke that if you, you know, walk into an Equinox or other high-end gym, you know, all the gorgeous staff has their abs hanging out. But if you walk in a peak brain, everyone's a good listener and calm and kind. You know, it's a different kind of skill set, but it's still hanging out, you know. So, uh, and I have like 20 something and 30 something, you know, staff a lot of the time. So they're like these really low key meditator vibes, just because when the office has downtime, they're training their executive function, their SMR, their alpha. And, and generally, all my staff is well regulated because they're sleeping great, handling stress really well, shrugged off any old ADHD stuff or old you know, anxiety stuff that they came into college with, or whatever. So, uh, it's nice to be able to offer tools like that, essentially. I mean, you, you, you work with executives, you're giving agency, you're helping them understand what's happening inside their brains and helping them get tools and engage with practices to modify their behavior. That's all I'm doing, just the, the behavior that they're modifying happens to be a bit involuntary. So going directly at the brain to shape the behavior of the brain instead of engaging in voluntary behavior to shape the brain by doing voluntary stuff. That's the only real difference there. But, you know, uh, Ultimately, it's you know meditation, mindfulness, directed attention. A lot of the things your app does is directed attention, and most forms of directed attention will activate a particular circuit and then enhance plasticity in that circuit, so that you get a directed change. So if you're doing focused attention, you get cingulate changes. If you're doing meta, you're getting like HRV changes, you know, loving kindness stuff. If you're doing um, vipassana, present time awareness, you're getting a shift of awareness in the brain, the self-centered eye, and the, the cingulate up here, to the underside, the dorsal lateral, the, uh, the dorsal chunk of the prefrontal cortex activates. The more you do insight meditation or present time awareness, the less you become self-centered in your eyeness as you're meditating and you get sort of like a self-less perspective, which is what I hear comes with uh, decades of meditation in the, in the, in the antique literature. Uh, you know, what one says you get selfless. Um, yeah. I, I'm not sure I know what that would feel like, but that's what um, we see in the brain. We see the, the shift going from the switching system to the one that involves value without self-involved, yet the, the underside of the, of the frontal lobe. So. Take a big enough dose of psychedelics and you might know what that feels like pretty quickly. <laughs> but yeah, it, well, that, that comes from temporal lobe stuff, actually. We have, we have some spots yeah. in the temporal lobe, theorizes the God spot, hmm. that if you zap with electricity or TMS, magnetism, or take certain drugs, you create a, like a serotonin storm briefly in the, in the temporal lobe in a part that makes right. you feel, you know, one with everything and bliss yeah. and, you know, uh, understand the deeper meanings of, of, of the world theoretically. Um, I'm yeah, interested but, in ecstatic states, but I don't know if I, I don't know if I think there's actually something to that, you know, like mm -hmm. once the machine we we're using to perceive is altered, it's a little hard to trust what we're, what we judge, you know? So, I, I'm, I'm excited because it tells about the machinery of the system the same way I think it's interesting about brain injuries. Right. I've certainly engaged in altered states myself plenty. I mean, I think all humans do to some extent. Um, I have a lot of experience doing like ecstatic shamanic, you know, practices and things and have pursued some of that. 
but humans have been altering their brains since before we were human. You know, birds and squirrels look for fermented berry juice and get drunk. I'm sure when we were monkeys in trees, we were doing the same damn thing. Being like, oh, that fruit over there, when it ferments, I see pretty pictures. You know, I'm sure we were looking for stuff and, and altering our chemistry because we co-evolved. You know, the, the, in, in the brain, the, uh, the two big cannabinoid systems in brain and body involved in the immune and involved with pain and bliss, you know, anandamide receptors. We didn't even know what it was. We, a cannabis binds this thing in the brain. It's a, it's a cannabinoid receptor. And we discovered years later, the molecule we actually build that fits that, that receptor. So um, we co-evolved, you know, the world yeah. co-evolved. So we evolved with plants and we evolved with animals and we share a lot of the same chemistry and, uh, you know, yeah. I, think, I, think it's, I think it's important to take control of this stuff, essentially. Are you familiar with Terence McKenna's stoned ape theory of evolution? That, 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 that being stoned was the, was the impetus to, to what? You know, change? Yeah. Yeah, his hypothesis was that we were taking ingesting psilocybin mushrooms as our brains evolved. This is part of the mind expansion that allowed us to devi- develop these higher faculties, which is a little bit unsubstantiated, but an interesting uh, hypothesis. Well, the problem with that is it assumes that it's going to push the brain in a particular direction in one person that will actually have any impact right. on the next person. And most genetic studies we know about, there's not much inheritance. There is some epigenetics. You know, your grandparents or in a concentration camp or something or have extreme trauma, you have different cortisol because mm. epigenetics. You know, your, your parent, your, pre, your, your, grand, your grandmother's eggs get changed, so your mother's cortisol brain gets changed, and then she produces you, and you have different cortisol. It's, it, it cascades that way throughout development. But they're not massive effects for shifting huge, giant resources. And there are some studies that show certain brain uh, genetics flew through the, the humanoid population in some absurdly short time, like 20 or 30 or 40,000 years. Like, like, no, I couldn't have changed all at once. Right. It looks like brain density and size changed all at once in some blink of an eye. So something happened and all the different hominids like us all came out in a very, very short chunk of time. And we don't know why, but the brain density thing, um, you know, I, I, think, I think there's other more plausible, Occam's razor here, there's more plausible things. Yeah. Because you know, it wasn't one group of humans who found the cool mushrooms in that one cave, you know? It, it was all over the place. Humans were, were growing and evolving, humanoids growing and evolving. And, and I really think it was, I mean, I think there's easier things to point at, to hang evolution on, like cooking carbohydrates and meat with fire so we freed up more of their nutrients and our brains could actually run on higher amounts of energy. Right. More yeah. REM sleep maybe too from the fire. Interesting, maybe, yeah. Or at least be able to control sleep a little differently. So we were, we were changing our regulation, you know. And once you start changing your environment, it just goes crazy. Think once we've changed in the past 100 years. You know, mm. once you start taking control, it's a little ridiculous of how rapidly this stuff evolves. Yeah. Um, that's what you know, Ray, Ray Kurzweil's singularity is all about, is that we're, we're accelerating so rapidly. The exponent as the tool of progress is happening so rapidly that any second now, we'll be able to go in and micromanage our physiology with technology hundred percent of the time. And I, I, I you know, I'm, I'm a gerontologist. I, I respect people like Aubrey de Grey and, and Ray Kurzweil who suggest that the, the, the anti-senescence, you know, movement of getting rid of the aging stuff, you know, it's interesting, but I, I think there's lots of things that individuals can do that aren't about anti-senescence or not aging. They're about living a nice, beautiful trajectory throughout your whole life or even improving it, you know, biohacking, instead of having a, a drop, which we, which we all have some sort of drop after age 30 usually and called sarcopenia. Um, so we're living an exciting time because the inflection points are all accelerating. But uh, just a little aside, I wouldn't worry about living forever, but I would worry about controlling things, the diseases of aging, because we now know most of the factors we can use to modify the risks and the progression of things like Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, diabetes, and cancer. Like those are the, the, the chronic diseases. In a modern society that's developed, the population pyramid goes from a lot of young people only a few old people, and as it develops, it regularized the population pyramid, and, and uh, we're here, basically, even when it's in there a little bit, where you have fewer younger people, we're still like this. We have a bump in the middle of our population pyramid called the pig and the python, and that's the boomers. The, the, you know, you see, you see a giant snake swallow a big male, it goes down the snake for years, you know, or, or, or hours, or, or days anyways. Well, the boomers are a pig in the python. They distorted American society by changing everything. They're twice as big as the previous or next generation. And all in the U.S. were built then, pretty much. 
um, it's a massive explosion of suburbia and everything else. And then there's an echo boom following along about 20 years later in that Python. But the, we're, we're doing this, and as you do this, as you become more regular a column, the causes of death change. You know, in societies where you have a lot of young people, the causes of death are include infectious things and illness and injuries. But in our societies, modern societies that have regularized, the causes of death are not chronic things, pretty much. You know, and so now it's now it's disease of aging, diabetes, cancer, dementias, and Parkinsonian things. And we know how to take control of about a lot of that stuff now, including backing up dementias to metabolic interventions. You know, including getting some cancers. The cancers now we have vaccines for, obviously. Um, so I think we're about to take even more control of the machinery, but um, I really doubled down in a place where I can give you specific access to your brain because it's always nice to be to get immediate benefits of these technological advancements, you know. So while I might be happy to, I don't know, get an injection in 20 years to make my skin look young, or you know, I don't know, maybe have some hair. That might be cool. I've never had hair really. Who knows? Not since I was like 20. Um, that'll happen. You know, you know the scientists, the scientists. You know they'll spend more effort in balding medication than they will in almost anything else. It's like, can you imagine the, the amount, of, amount of money spent on Viagra versus like some orphan disease? You know, this is what'll happen. It's, you know, so I'm sure that we'll figure out baldness. Actually, I think we did recently. There was a study a few years ago showing that we now know why gray hair happens in the sirtuin genes. We know, what, we know why sometimes there's veritrol versus gray hair. It's a strange phenomena. It's a genetic thing. It's an oxidative, oxidative stress thing, essentially. But it looks like the mechanism that causes hair to go gray is related to the one that causes hair to fall out, or at least to suppress uh, production. So, um, you know, five, 10, 20 years from now, all the old men who are wealthy will have giant flowing golden locks, you know? That'll be, that'll be the status symbol. Yeah. Instead of the weird, like, backwards right. transplants and things like our president <laughs> has, you know, it'll, be, it'll be flowing locks of natural grown hair because I have the money for it, you know, the, the right. status symbol at that point. So, yeah, sorry, I'd be a little bit ranty, but no, no, I love it. So I, I wanted to bring this back because I wanted to ask you about you were mentioning, you know, gamma, any device that's claiming and can help you with gamma waves is kind of a knockoff. But I know that yeah. this is something that with the right equipment, certain neuroscientists can study. And I, I'm not sure, sure if you're, you're familiar with um, the work of Dr. Judson Brewer or uh, yeah. Richie Davidson over at and, University yeah, of Wisconsin. Sarin. Yeah, and Cliff Sarin is the same same group. And Cliff and, and those guys showed some gamma up to about 400 hertz, I think, at least 200. I saw Cliff do a talk on the Samatha Project um, at UCLA a few years ago. He was showing gamma. Gamma is not one thing; it's many, many things. Right. But it seems to be from about 40 to maybe as high as like 400 hertz. And the big takeaway message there, I think, and this is my perspective, is that increased meditation over years causes increased gamma coupling throughout the brain. And interestingly enough, you see the opposite phenomena in progressive schizophrenia. You see decreased gamma coupling in some of the same regions. So gamma, or 40 hertz-ish, like that frequency for gamma, is involved with something about attention, awareness, consciousness, um, if you will. And, and there's a, basically you can measure gamma through the skull if you use what are called active electrodes, where you're boosting the, you basically put an amplifier at every location. It's fairly expensive to do. And so you need to spend usually 60, 80 grand in hardware to, to do it. That's why I'm saying consumer devices don't do it because there's, two, there's knockoffs. There's lo, low end vaporware usually. But you can measure it with the right technology, even if you not, aren't opening the skull up. And one of the ways this has been used, because uh, theta waves I mentioned are four hertz, about four cycles per second. And gamma waves are about 40, at least the classic gamma. Well, that's a nice math. And turns out the brain knows that too. They nest in, fre in frequency. So you get a gamma theta nesting 40 to 4 hertz coupling, cross frequency coupling. They echo together. 4 hertz, 40 hertz, 40 hertz, 40 hertz, 40 hertz, and then it re-echoes again. They, they, they phase synchronize again and again and again when you're conscious. And when you're not conscious, they're out of phase. So you can break the phase coupling of theta and gamma waves, 4 and 40 hertz, and you go unconscious. So you can measure that. In surgery, uh, I think uh, AstraZeneca, one of the big companies has the, the bispectral index uh, device in surgery and then measure the coupling in the forehead and the anesthesiologist can tell the depth of consciousness on a meter, on a single number, based on you know, if, if there's this coupling or not. And it turns out, now this is gonna look crazy, it looks like some of what anesthetics do, anesthesia does, 
is it changes the, not just the coupling, but it looks like it changes some of the way microtubules work deep inside neurons. And here's where it gets very crazy. I'm gonna break one of my own rules and use the word quantum. Uh, but it looks like the diameter of microtubules is roughly about what it would take for water molecules to quantum tunnel from one place to the next without, without making the journey in between. So there's some people out there in the edge of neuroscience and quantum physics who are suggesting the consciousness is the quantum state embedded, you know, calculated by microtubules deep in neurons. And that is using to sort of project out to the real world brain, Newtonian physics brain, the theta gamma coupling. So you can get gamma experiences. A lot of what the biohackers talk about in, in the sort of consumer devices, a couple out there use a technique called tag sync, theta alpha gamma sync. And they're not measuring gamma, I know they aren't, but you can do a lot of the pushing on gamma if you push on theta because of the coupling. So if you train alpha and theta in relationship to each other, you cause um, a flow state. You can cause crossover states. That moment when you fall asleep at night and you remember like that cool thing you have to do or you solve world hunger maybe, I don't know. Um, then you fall asleep and you're like, wait, I had the best idea last night. That moment of nonlinear thought where stuff's bubbling up is a crossover and a hypnogogic access point. And it's very similar to the access point moving into creativity, voluntary creativity. So you can train the theta alpha relationships to um, be more flexible. And then you can reach for that state internally and go into a flow state or have creativity. There's some work done at a, one of the big performance colleges in London a couple of years ago, a paper came out showing that the group at the music uh, college, the, the group that did neurofeedback versus the group that didn't got a whole grade level, grade level above uh, improvement with a little bit of neurofeedback. And it was not a function of like anxiety or performance, you know, fear or anything that controlled for that. It was creativity, improvisational ability, musicality. Those are the things that were rated higher. Um, so if you aren't creative enough, you can do alpha theta neurofeedback and build it up. I actually get calls all the time from, uh, I work with a lot of CEO types, high powered, hard charging, you know, performance people, usually men. And they often are pretty shut down emotionally and don't meditate. You know, it's hard to get some of those guys. I'm sure you know, some of the executives, their emotional IQ isn't exactly where you might want it to be, or their willingness to deal with the internal environment isn't necessarily, you know, all that healthy always, um, or at least all that accessible or practiced, let's say, or skillful. Um, well, some of these people will do alpha theta, because um, while I'll do it as a peak performance thing, generally, and I'll get calls from their spouses. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Whatever you did, do it again and next time. You'll be the best conversation you've ever had. Like, they weren't defensive at all. They were, wow, you know, great. So, you know, pianists call me having been super amazing, sort of emotive on their musicianship. Actors call me, you know, winning their improv, you know, competitions. And uh, spouses call me when they're jerk of a, uh, or they're, they're rigid, let's say, and, and overly productive and a bit burnt out CEO type a spouse will uh, suddenly kind of like roll back some of that callous and be a little more fluid with their interaction. So again, the point is you have control over this stuff. So, you know, shift happens, get yours. Are, are there other promising areas that would combine the spatial accuracy of say fMRI with the temporal accuracy of EEG, that kind of the next level, because I know EEGs yeah. have been around for a while and it seems like in some sense, it's kind of like modern day, uh, what, like modern day phrenology, like you're kind of looking at a brain yeah. region and you're yeah. saying like, okay, this is correlated with certain states. Like what's the next level for us? Uh, great question. So EEG, electricity has a timing precision of about a millisecond. You can measure electricity very rapidly but it spreads out throughout the brain. So you can't really measure where it's coming from with great precision. In a typical single electrode in the head measured compared to something else not nearby, half of the signal is coming from right underneath it, being generated right there. And half the signal is coming from everywhere else, summed together, averaging out, mixing. But the things that are not from right underneath it are not the same time relationship. Uh, so there's stuff that's lagged and stuff that's instantaneous coming together essentially. So this is the unmixing problem. And, if, and you can actually take the EEG and you can unmix the scalp signal. So a, a full head EEG and a sleep, you know, traditional EEG, old school EEG is 19 scalp channels plus ears. And you can unmix the signals and project where they're coming from in the brain. This is analogous to like putting a bunch of microphones up at your party, making a map of where they were, 
doing a recording and then later on making a map of who was speaking and where they were based on unmixing the different position of the microphones. Oh, he's in this direction from that microphone, this one from the, oh, he must have been over there. So you're doing source analysis, it's called an inverse solution. You're unmixing the scalp signals. And with 19 channels on the head, you know, it's still pretty blobby, but you, you, your source of fade is a, a few centimeters. And fMRI has a voxel spatial precision, about a square, about a cubic millimeter, almost, is what, a, what fMRI will do in terms of spatial precision. The timing precision in fMRI is very, very poor because it relies on the, on the bold response, the blood oxygen level dependent response, i.e. your brain calls for resources, they show up about a second later. So the way you work in fMRI studies is you block the same event or stimulus or task into several hundred chunks so you can get the blood level going up and staying up and go, oh, okay, there it is compared to this other state. But it's a slow thing. So if there's transient events or sort of coming offline and coming online briefly, you miss them. So what you can do is you can increase the density of the EEG. And when you go from 19 to 32, which is the next step up generally, you get some pretty good precision, spatial precision. And when you hit 70 electrodes, the spatial precision of the solution, of the EEG solution, is equivalent to the precision of fMRI. So you get the cheap technology relatively, a full head, it's a dense array, you know, because these things aren't cheap, but you're talking 70, 80 grand, not a million bucks of helium and $2 million of hardware. That's what an MRI costs, because the, it's the helium that costs, one of the big costs is the helium you put in those things, or other gases, because we don't have any, you know, we're running out of helium. You can't, don't, don't get your helium balloons, because we have very, very little left in the world. <laughs> um, all the MRI machines need it. It costs, it costs so much money, $100 million maybe, you know, to like fill up your machine, it's ridiculous. Well, I'm, I'm exaggerating, but it's really expensive stuff. Your lab will, you know, if you're an MRI guy, set up a lab, Half your cost is the machine, half the cost is your helium, and you have you know, broke grad students, basically, at that point. Um, anyways. So, uh, where were we? Did I, did I answer the last question? I think I was sidetracked. Yeah, so you were describing how 70 uh, electrodes gives yeah. you the same spatial accuracy as an fMRI, essentially? Yeah, so, so that is sort of the answer, is that at 70 electrodes, you reach the spatial precision. You're asymptoting against it, essentially. You're not quite there, but any more electrodes don't really add more spatial precision. And now you have millisecond timing precision, and you've got almost a voxel, you know, that same cubic millimeter of spatial precision with EEG. Mm. So this means that the average person, you know, doing deep brain analysis and deep brain research is actually accessible because you don't need to spend millions of dollars to buy an MRI machine and fill it up with, with, with uh, rare gases, you can just buy yourself. I mean, even a 19 channel cap. I mean, this device here, this is a 19 channel headset. Um, this costs about five grand. And then a full head cap with, uh, I have a bunch over there, I won't bother pulling one out, but those are like 300 bucks. So for, you know, five, six grand, you can do a somewhat coarse source analysis, deepen your brain and figure out where brainwaves are coming from. And, and the tool that's used to unmix the scalp signals is open source and free. It's called Loretta, L-O-R-E-T-A. And there's several variants of it called E-Loretta and S-Loretta that make different assumptions in their math. But the, 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 the most recent ones were quite good. And I do believe um, there's some papers out by Pasquale Marquis, uh, Roberto, Roberto Pasquale Marquis, who's the inventor of Loretta. And he shows side by side fMRI and Loretta solutions that look very, very compelling. I've seen him present these at, at, at meetings and things. Very compelling. So I don't think if I was an MRI person, unless I cared specifically about metabolic blood flow, I wouldn't be using MRI. Um, and if I was caring about blood flow, I might use a different technology completely called uh, HEG, um, hemoencephalography, or even NIRS, near infrared spectroscopy. These are sort of ways of looking at metabolism by using infrared sensors and building up a picture of those. And so the cost is dramatically reduced compared to MRI. An MRI, for folks that may not know, is a giant magnet, and then you bounce radio waves through the magnet, and the interference pattern as it hits tissue is what you're picking up. So like, kind of like you know, the, the, the MRI machine is the stage for the cameraman to take a picture of you, and the, and the camera is the radio wave bouncing off of you. And then to pick up different tissues and make them show up differently or see what's active, an fMRI, which is metabolic, you want to tag the tissues that are active with, in the case of fMRI, functional, versus just the tissue, you want to tag it with usually radioactive tracers. So mm -hmm. oxygen, glucose, dopamine, something with a slight radioactive trace that you can then take a, 
picture of it, it sticks out against the background tissue. So MRI is expensive. fMRI is a bit invasive with radioactivity. Um, it's a research tool because we don't, because brains are so different. And there are, as far as I know, not database of thousands and thousands and thousands of fMRI norms. So while you can do a SPECT scan, NIRS or spectroscopy, this is what the, the Amon centers do. They do infrared blood flow, uh, infrared, they use um, uh, the, the MRI magnet to do a blood flow analysis, essentially a metabolic analysis. But, but then you're just left with a picture of activation levels. You, don't, you actually aren't left with any sort of graded or interpreted perspective. You have, you're sort of beholden to your scientist or your clinician to interpret it. And in brain mapping, the, the EEG stuff, you get the analysis compared to people your age. So while you don't get a valid label, oh, it means X, attention, you do get a valid bit of data. Oh, it's beta or it's alpha speed or something. And those things are kind of like looking at your, you know, your 23 me genes. We don't understand them perfectly, but you can learn, you can dig in, you can try things. You know, if you have a weird anxiety thing and do a, do a methylation analysis on your genes, maybe you'll discover you want to try uh, hydroxycobalamin or something, you know, because of your the data points you found. It's not a big deal to try different B vitamin variants. You can dig in, you can try things, and you'll probably improve your cognition if you have a problem, you know, like anxiety or something because of an MTHFR. You'll do well by getting the right variant of B12, not just any B12. And that's what we're talking about with this functional medicine stuff, this sort of functional biohacking, is that it's not really our job, you know, the, the scientist, the doctor, the, the provider, I don't think it should be our job to decide what to do and to make meaning even of like, what's your fade away mean? What's your alpha speed? But if we can help you navigate interpreting data and then you can go ahead and take snapshots of it throughout your life, then you'll use it the same way you might use your change in your CRP scores or your, you know, for us men, your, 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 your uh, prostate antigens or, you know, your testosterone. You can use those, those levels as they change. I mean, I can look at your brain. You're, you're, you're young enough. Your alpha would be healthy, I would assume. But if you were 10 years older and I saw your alpha waves running slower than they should for your age, I would know that chances are extremely good. You're having delayed recall for words and naming issues when you're tired. People often in their 40s and 50s are scared they're getting dementia. And that's the first symptom that shows up for um, a speed of processing issue is a delayed access to words. It's not your memory, it's your speed and it's changeable, really quickly changeable. But I can predict that. Look at your brain again, your alpha is running slow. Oh, slow alpha usually means speed of processing. Are you having word finding issues? I am. Great, let's work on that. That's an easy one. So again, I'm trying to reframe always back to the idea that you have agency, no matter what it is, even if it's not discreetly, perfectly understood, you know, it's fitness. You can try and see how it feels and then build it if it's the right thing. You know, if it feels good after the gym that day, do it again. Feel sore, maybe back off or adjust. And so you're a good neurofeedback person is doing this iterative thing. Um, and, and I find that, you know, back to the source analysis question, doing the source analysis in the brain, again, is only interesting from a research perspective. You know, no psychiatrist or neurologist I, I know that works clinically would use an fMRI to make a clinical decision. So, you know, you, you do fMRI to learn about brains in general, not one person's brain but you might do QEEG to learn only about one person's brain, not about brains in general. So it's a completely different framing to do a population level uh, sort of, you know, source analysis, if you will. Right, yeah, fMRI, it's comparing a baseline to some other state, yeah. Yeah, but then you want 10 people, so you can see that under this one condition, the same 10 brains operate, oh, attention must work right. this way, because it's operating this way in this blood flow. But you aren't, you aren't answering questions about the 10 people ever in fMRI. It's always averaging huge numbers of data together. The yeah. QEG is literally you compared to a few thousand people to see right. how you're unique and interesting and yeah. quirky and wonderful and weird. So, Well, one of the things I love about your work, and this is also my passion at FitMind, is thinking about what is the mind capable of? Mm. Like what are, what's the full potential of the human mind? So what do you, what do you foresee? Like what's your vision for Kind of the future where people could take this i know just you know in terms of my own research and kind of experience with different meditative te techniques you know i have i have a you know i'm fairly certain at this point that there are people that can take those meditation techniques and train their minds so that they're in a state of just constant bliss essentially um, mm -hmm. and i'm curious if you know is there some equivalent of that where someone could use neurofeedback or in the future you think you know a lot of people will be doing this to really get their mind into optimal states 
Um, I, I do think that a lot of people will be using a bunch of techniques in the future, more and more and more. I think, you know, using neurofeedback will be, you know, in the 40s and 50s, people didn't go to the gym, you know, in the 40s at least. But now it's a giant marketplace. Everyone's doing fitness, everyone's doing kettlebells and, you know, their, their CrossFits and whatever else. And everyone's really quite, I mean, the average, you know, dad bod now versus the 70s, quite different, right? For a guy who's like in his 30s and is thinking about this kind of stuff. And we know about heart disease, we know about that fat isn't bad for us now. And it was all carbs fault, you know, essentially in terms of oxidative stress and, and glycation. Um, but I don't think people will end up being blissed out all the time and will end up achieving state permanence. And I don't think we should. I think human brains are meant to range across a whole bunch of states, hours, days, and minutes. And flexible access to states is what we should be going for, not turning on states. The high performers, you know, it's not about pushing you up and up and up and up into like the best possible performance. It's about smoothing out all the variability so that you perform adequately or at your good level, no matter how you're feeling. But it doesn't mean your states will shift. It just means you'll get stuck in your states. So I work with a lot of people get stuck in like a perseverative state. The mind gets very hyper-focused. But that's not necessarily useful or flexible. It, it, it happened for a reason. Um, but it's not always serving you. So let me give you an example specifically. Uh, there's a part of the brain in the back middle called the posterior cingulate. His job it is to evaluate the environment around you. And if you learn the world is not safe or predictable, the, the posterior cingulate gets a little bit clenched and it's threat sensitive and you ruminate and worry, it kind of, can be PTSD if it goes too far. But when it's not PTSD, we all use the, the posterior cingulate. You're at a ball game, look at your phone, somebody else heads up and you actually look up and catch the ball, that's the posterior cingulate. Oh, gotta reorient. Oh, cool, caught, caught, caught this ball, kept yourself safe. Or you're driving a car and you're fishing around on the floor of your car, not that you would do this, but if you did, that sense of, uh, watch the road, that's the posterior cingulate. We all need one. So I view this kind of like somebody with a spasm low back. You know, humans low back tends to get a bit messed up because we're not especially well engineered to be upright the way we are. You know, it's just kind of a weak spot. And the world can push on our lower back, the erector muscles get really tight, spasm up to protect the spine. But then later on, they're hyperactivated. They're very strong muscles, but not well regulated. So I wouldn't want any of my resources tonically activated because they'll cause problems the same way as like a lower back would. But if my posterior cingulate is too chilled, if you relax it too much, now you're tranquilized, you're not threat sensitive. If you're like, look at the tiger, hey, pretty kitty, instead of running away, you know? So you want a healthy range of these resources. And to some extent, I think the biggest thing that will happen is we'll understand the resources. You'll know that, oh, I have ADHD, and they go and tweak that resource. Oh, I have a seizure, or I have OCD, or PTSD, or something. And it will be just like, you know, dropping 3% of body fat at Equinox or something. Like it'll be just that mechanical and the stigma will get, will drop away too. Anxiety, attention, stress, sleep, aging, trauma, all this stuff is just individual circuits to some extent getting a little bit tweaked or worn out or pinched or cramped. There's different metaphors, but I think we're, we will understand that we don't need, like, I don't think we need Adderall for 99.9% .9 of people or any, any stimulants for 99.9% .9 of people who take them. Train out the problem, you know, and the same is true for anxiety meds or sleep meds. There are no sleep meds, but nothing that actually causes sleep. But you can do a lot rapidly by training up the SMR response, the sleep spindle thing. So that's what I think we'll get access to is more of a, just like we can, we can, we can carve off some body fat with our home gym or know about intermittent fasting and work with a coach to dial in some control over our insulin if it's out of range. Well, we can get some control over our threat sensitivity or our distractibility, if that's gotten out of range because of fatigue or our genetics or our trauma and experience, it should be just as you know, accessible. It's like, I'd rather not be this upset all the time, or I'd rather not carry around all the trauma you know, response or not be able to feel safe with, in relationships or get rid of this stupid seizure. You know, for most of us, the brain is phenomenally more changeable than we think it is. It's always changing. And we're just starting to get a handle on how we can push it around specifically. I think that's going to get much more nuanced in the near future. Nice. Well, do you have a, a couple of minutes for some rapid fire questions here at the end? Sure. Okay. So coolest travel experience you've had? Coolest, huh? 
How about most strange? I was attacked by an ape when I was visiting the island of Gibraltar as a 14 year old. <laughs> I was mauled by a Barbary ape. I have scars on my, on my arm from a, oh my a God. Little, four, four foot tall, grizzled uh, old ape that, that beat me up a little bit. Jesus. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, favorite brain food? Favorite brain food? Probably eggs. Okay. What about, Probably what are your thoughts? I, I love, I crush eggs. <laughs> I've actually gotten that answer on here before. So you got it. It's the best, perfect food. And you've also you're involved with a nootropics company, right? Yeah, I helped. Uh, I helped uh, uh, True Brain when they pivoted yeah. from a triathlete supplement into into the True Brain. Um, they created a whole range of initial nootropic products, and I helped Chris Thompson design and test the effects of all the first round of products. Um, it's since developed a little more. I actually just got Chris to send me all the new products, the, the, some food bars, and some ketones, but I wasn't really involved with that piece of it, just all the initial, you know, helping the company up and running for the first few years. Um, I do think nootropics are useful, but I like you, I like them as a gap filler later on mm. after you've gotten rid of, I mean, my, my first rule of biohacking is fix the stuff you do every day, mm. you know, and I think nootropics are a second strategy on top of that. And for some of us, they gap fill things we can't fix with lifestyle interventions. And they're also really useful for anti-aging, pro-brain health, you know, brain injury stuff. So I, I like some nootropics as lifelong strategies in day in, day out, and a few others as like, okay, you gotta be on for the fourth time that day or something, you know, well maybe some paracetam for verbal fluency or, you know, whatever else. But I don't, I, I don't do many nootropics myself anymore because I, I like to change the whole system, make a permanent change versus just making a transient change. And the nootropics that I encourage people to take, like my mom, um, are things that help her age better. Like she calls me, I'm out of paracetam again, or CB choline, because we know that that's a good thing for her. She loves how it feels. We have some Alzheimer's and Parkinson's in our family. So she's like, you know, she's basically keto or, or paleo in her diet. And she does basic good nootropics to keep herself from aging and slowing down at, you know, in her seventies, basically. Um, and my mom does call me about twice a year and say, you know, I'm out of nootropics again. Where can I get them again? Because, you know, the, it's, it's all like a, a a true brain, the nootropic company I helped create is a bit of a big player. There's only about three, four players that do, you know, consumer based nootropics. And then all the old school nootropics are still a little fly by night. So the websites mm -hmm. will vanish and the sources will go away. And paracetam, which is one of the original ones, is hard to get sometimes. So I get a call from my mom, like I'm her drug dealer. Where can I get paracetam now? I have to find some. So it's kind of funny. My, my, my little hobbit mom who's working on her brain and then stay super sharp until, you know, she's, she's quite old, I'm sure. So. This is the mom who uh, three months ago, just to get your viewers a sense of who she is or your, your listeners, um, she was in the jungles of uh, Vietnam and Laos, I think, and she got sick and so she ended up nursing herself back to health, eating python and bison jerky for a couple of weeks in the middle of the forest without any, you know, electricity or anything, some random forest out there. Oh and then she hiked, and she hiked back into some part of Asia and she ended up getting into Japan just before all the, all the borders closed. Last year, she was on all the islands down in Antarctica visiting different breeds of penguins. Oh my God. You know, she's, yeah, and she's, and she's in her 70s. So, Jeez. Uh, she's, she's a good biohacker. My, my, I aspire to be half the biohacker my mom is. <laughs> yeah, that's your, uh, your family vacation sounds really eventful. The oh no, no, she goes on these by herself. And, oh my no, no, God. The, the, the apes when I was a kid, that was my grandparents. Yeah, but my mom traipses around the world by herself with a friend. Um, and does these crazy, like she white water rafts, she, you know, she doesn't do the things tourists do. She does the thing like crazy hardcore athletes does. And she's like five feet tall and 70 years old and 70 something years old, you know, like it's kind of funny. Super you know? mom. That's awesome. Yeah, she really is. She really is. It's great. So the nootropics might be working. I don't know. I hope you <laughs> hear this because, because it really is just her. She's just that, that awesome. But yeah. uh, the nootropics aren't, aren't hurting and they're probably helping her stay healthy long-term. And that's, I mean, I'm a big fan of some nootropics. I think people with some memory issues and or some myelination issues should look into CDP choline. I'm a big fan of CDP choline or citicoline because it helps the brain remyelinate and it mm. helps the uh, brain use choline differently. So after taking it for a few weeks and months, you'll create phosphatidylcholine differently within your cells. So, it so all those eggs we're eating and a little bit of CDP choline here and there, you'll use choline from the eggs very, very differently. Um, after several weeks and months of that. So I'm a big fan, you know, for a few nootropics, but I would almost drop back to supplement strategy and say, well, you know, vitamin C, vitamin D3, and some B vitamins are generally, you know, a great strategy 
Um, I think in these post-pandemic world, I really do think people should be prophylactically dosing high amounts of vitamin C and D. You know, typically, D is about 5,000 IUs. I think in these you know, pandemic times, we should be doing 10,000 IUs a day, even young people, and you know, having a few grams of ascorbic acid every day just to keep our system nice and high. And then if you get sick with the respiratory thing, you add some zinc. But um, you know, it does look like vitamin D status and ascorbic acid and a few other things that are in the body will impact how sick you get if you get COVID. Mm-hmm. Um, I saw a study showing some of the aging stuff, the APOE4 variant that causes rap- more rapid oxidation in Alzheimer's and atherosclerosis is, um, it causes much faster damage under COVID as well. So th- there are, appear to be some things that make you protected against uh, those inflammatory you know, states, but I think all of us, again, just like we have opportunities to stay healthy, every day, do small little things that will have huge impacts. Bumping up your vitamin D status is really pretty innocuous and seems to do a lot. Bumping mm-hmm. up your, your, your onboard vitamin C is pretty cheap and won't hurt you and it might do a lot. So I'm a big fan of these sorts of things as lifestyle interventions about what we're talking about. This becomes important. But I think all of us should do lots of things we can do every day, like get up early, like don't eat before bed, meditate, you know, and, uh, uh, using this awesome app that I, I heard a thing or two about, for instance, you know? Um, so there's all kinds of things that we can pursue. Uh, I think we all should, essentially. Nice. Okay, I got two more for you. Um, favorite technology that you're excited about? Favorite technology? Um, I'm, I don't know. I'm not, there's, there's no technology really that I'm waiting for that's really real. I, I'm, I'm in the process of taking technologies that haven't been combined in different ways and making new consumer tools. And I'm you know, going to start pushing the envelope a little bit in brain technologies and toys. But I, I'm a little bit annoyed that there's a couple of things we haven't solved yet um, in technology. And I don't think that, I mean, I, I, I don't like think what? we're going to be uh, like, like getting to other planets effectively. <laughs> I really, really wish Elon Musk would stop talking about the brain. I don't think he, anything he says makes sense. The Neuralink think, stuff? No, it's nonsense. <laughs> he can't add up to the same. It's nonsense. He's rehashing all the same old problems people have been doing in BCI, brain conditioning, for years. And I have yet to hear anything new that solves any of the classic problems. So I, what I would wish he would focus on, give us a 1G drive. Excel, uh, something, a rocket ship that can put out 1G of acceleration constantly with a, radi- with a nuclear reactor or something. It's not that high tech. 1G drive, that's all I want. A 1G drive would get us to the Proxima and Alpha Centauri cluster with deceleration time in about seven years. Because a 1G drive can actually get close to the speed of light. No sci-fi. You know, it's four light years away or something. So it's you get just a year acceleration, you get some fraction of light speed, and then you go for three years and decelerate for three years and you're there. Now, I won't tell you how much time's passed on Earth, it's very strange, but that's not sci-fi. With a 1G drive, we could get to other planets, you know, relatively quickly. So he's all about, let's save the Earth and go to Mars. We don't want to go to Mars. Mars doesn't have a core that rotates. It's blasted with radiation all the time. We're never going to be able to live on Mars, in, you know, for thousands of years. It just is not viable. So, so we got to shoot planet. for other, okay, out of the solar, other solar system. systems. We need to go to other solar systems if we want to go to other planets. Because the ones we have aren't that good to live on. So how far that's away? I'm frustrated by, by folks in the wrong stuff, Mr. Musk, you know? <laughs> so how far away are we from that, you think? We would be there in a year if somebody decided to do it. Okay. But right now, no one's working on it. No one's working on it, as far as I know. I mean, I, I think NASA probably is working on it. Um, a couple of years ago, they tested the, uh, the weird... We're not sure quite how they work drives, the, the CAN-A drive or M drives. These things have been produced. Um, those are not producing very much thrust, you know, but maybe they'll figure out how to produce one gravity thrust out of it. Probably not. But, you know, we could do um, anything that's massless, anything where we're generating a field instead of an ejectant, if you will, propellant. We potentially, you can do forever. And we could run a nuclear reactor and figure out some way to charge a field and you know, collect small amounts of plasma and heat it up or something. There's, there's ways to do it. 1G is not that much of a technical hurdle, you know, at all. Uh, and I think that if we, if we cared about, you know, modern tech like that, 
The other one is desalination. I don't, I don't think that we're, we're spending enough effort on, de on getting clean water. You know, like I, I really do think we're going we're gonna to have to technolog uh, technologically solve our way out of global warming and uh, societal breakdown through resources not being available, air and water and food, but mostly air and water is the issue. And I believe that we should be focusing strongly on carbon capture with machinery and technology and desalination with machinery and technology so that everybody gets clean water and clean air and that would stabilize the globe's rapidly shifting political i, I really do think most of what's happening is going to be like politically and globally and geopolitics is mostly going to be destroyed like the the big head that we're coming to is going to be about resource competition in the next 10 20 30 years and ha i mean we saw before all this current nonsense with the pandemic past five, 10 years, been a lot of emphasis on the, the refugee stuff as other regions of the world, quote unquote, destabilize. Well, without water or air, like in 10, 20 years, half the world's gonna be starving nomads, you know, yeah. Mad Max wandering, looking for water. So I really do think we should be focusing on fundamental problems on the planet of like carbon sequestering. There's a power plant, I think in Iceland, it's at the top of a geothermal vent and they use the heat in the geothermal vent to generate electricity, and then they grab carbon out of the air and sequester it in the basalt rock that the, that the uh, power plant's on top of. So it's a carbon negative power plant. It uses, it, 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 sto it stores more carbon than it releases. Wow. You know, we can do stuff like that. Wind power, water power, you know, I think we're really missing the boat, and I, I think that we're not gonna have time to do it in 10 or 20 years. When every every nation is, you know, I mean, you're probably not old enough, but when I was a kid, you couldn't buy bottled water. Why would you buy bottled water? Why would you just buy water? <laughs> and then Pepsi and Coke got into it in the '80s. Now, you know, you got to buy water. So I'm I'm concerned about that kind of stuff on the planet. I'm also concerned that we should be getting off the planet. And you know, there's a couple of things that people aren't solving that they should solve. People who oh. say they are the uh, the Tony Starks of this world need to be like solving the real big problems. Yeah, well, listeners, future Elon Musk's, you got your challenge. Right. Doctor Hill wants a one G drive, and he wants de desalination, desalination, one G drive, desalination, and carbon sequestration, all via technology. I think these are all within reach. I just think that, and, and here's the thing: anyone who solves that, or or at least gets a disruptive leg up on that, is going to be richer than anyone's ever been in the world. So, you know, do, do well by doing good. Enlighten self-interest. Okay, so on that um, similar vein, this is my last kind of quick, uh, quick fire question. You got 15 seconds in a commercial that goes out to the whole world. What's your message? Oh, I don't need 15 seconds. The message is shift happens, get yours. Your brain is changing. It's not if, it is changing all the time every day. Just decide how, learn about it, and take control. Nice. I love it. I love it. Well, thanks for coming on the FitMind podcast. Um, are, finally, I guess, are, is there anywhere that people could connect with you or learn more about yeah. your work? Yeah, thanks, Liam. So um, uh, thanks for having me, first of all. If people want to track me down on socials, my company is usually Peak Brain LA. It's all over all the, all the socials uh, or Peak Brain Institute. And then I'm Andrew Hill PhD on the socials, although I gotta, gotta acknowledge my Instagram is almost entirely pictures of baked goods. <laughs> baked lots of bread. So you can look at baked Food goods on my personal Instagram. And if you go to Peak Brain LA is one, you can look at the brain memes and quotes and things like that. Nice. Um, and then I have a podcast, which has been on hiatus for a while, a video podcast called Head First with Dr. Hill, which is for bi uh, biohackers. And of course I'm on a bunch of podca podcasts like this one. I'll probably relaunch mine. Uh, I'm trying to figure out the best format to do it in. So uh, if folks find the head first with Dr. Hill podcast, and if you have guest suggestions, please give them to me because uh, I'm going to start probably figuring out a way to crank out a lot more content in a lot of different ways. Um, now that, you know, we, we sort of need to do more virtual stuff. Uh, it's time to double down on that. I think a little bit myself. So please folks, let me know your brain questions, your, your, your favorite guests who I should talk to. And come ask me your brain questions. And also, we're going to give everyone who's a listener of your show, Liam, a half price on the brain map. So they can come to any peak brain office and get, instead of 500 bucks, it's 250 for the brain map. Nice. And we also offer free repeats, which is very strange. So it's a sort of open-ended biohacker, you know, delight special, basically, to, 
learn and learn and learn forever about your brain. Um, we have offices in St. Louis, LA, and uh, Southern California, Costa Mesa. Um, but half my clients train their brains at home, so we can do work with you guys. So I would say track us down and let us know what you want to do to your brain, and we will help you get things moving. Awesome. Well, this has been really fun. Thanks, Dr. Hill. Oh, my pleasure, Liam. Thanks so much for having me.